So this week we're going to talk about somebody that I'm a big fan of, and I have been since I found them, even though it took me a number of years because they were on movie soundtracks and recording with other acts. He even had a couple albums out that I wasn't aware of. But he hit big in 1986, and since then I've been a huge fan. And my thing is, I don't get why nobody else likes to admit it. He's one of those artists that you love all the way around, usually, and yet to admit that you are a fan is to commit heresy of some sort. Especially if you're male, which I don't get. But then again, I'm the OG pop guy. I don't, I'm not, I don't get embarrassed very easily when it comes to my musical choices, as the vinyl community knows. I'm going to go over what I know, what I have, show you some stuff you probably haven't seen. I'm going to tell you about the man and the instrument he wields, the soprano saxophone. This week on Influencers, the always awesome and much maligned Kenny G. This is the show where I talk about the artists that have been a part of my life and why. Why I like them, why I listen to them, why I think everybody should. This is Influencers. I'm T.C. Kirkham, TKR Video Central and The Kirkham Report. This week, Kenneth Gorlick from Seattle, Washington. More popularly known and professionally known as saxophone player Kenny G. Now, many people won't admit to liking Kenny G because... Well, they consider his music wussy music. He actually is, you know, a lot of hard jazz fans don't like smooth jazz or jazz fusion, with some exceptions. Kenny has made a, a, a career of, his, of his, uh, his style of playing. It's no different than the kind of career that Herb Alpert had in the 60s that Ferranti and Teicher had with their twin pianos. It's just a different instrument and a different way of doing it. I knew Kenny G from 1985 from a single called Love on the Rise, but like everyone else, I really fell in love with his stuff with Songbird, his monster hit from 1986, which climbed all the way to number four on Billboard's Hot 100, which was unheard of considering it was so unlike everything else that was on the radio at the time. It was a fantastic song. As a result, I picked up the album, and then I picked up his three earlier albums, and then I would buy his next several albums in succession. I did finally stop buying all of them in the mid-90s, but I've listened to all of them. I haven't seen the documentary about him that uh, I believe airs on Max or Amazon, uh, listening to Kenny G, it was made by one of my favorite filmmakers, the always awesome Penny Lane, who did Nuts and Hail Satan. Wonderful documentary filmmaker. I haven't watched it because I know that she tends to do a little bit comic uh, looks at things sometimes. Still intense and upfront, but with comic twists. And I've heard that that is very much evident in the, in the, in the documentary. I will watch it one of these days. But we're not here to talk about the documentary. We're here to talk about his music. He began playing way back when he was just 10 years old after he saw a sax player on the Ed Sullivan Show. That would have been sometime in the mid-60s. He would become a professional musician 
by playing with Barry White's Love Unlimited Orchestra right out of high school in 1973, and later would play a considerable amount of time with the Jeff Lorber Fusion in the late 70s and early 80s. He signed a solo contract with Arista Records in 1982. The first appearance he made under that contract was a saxophone riff on one of the songs on Miko's Ewok Celebration album. I'm not sure which song it was. I'd have to go back and look. I think he does Maniac. Uh, but he, he's playing the sax over another singer. Something else he's made an expert at the last 40 years. He is just dynamite. Now, I'm going to show off what I have on vinyl. I have four albums on vinyl. The rest are all on CD. Um... And I have a particular reason for wanting to show the vinyl. For the first two albums that were released, which I went back and got later, they completely changed the album artwork when they came out on CD. And I thought that was hilarious because the album artwork on the CDs, as I'll show you in a second, um, was great, but it showed Kenny G as he was then when these were re-released around the time... Uh, Duo Tones came out after Songbird took off. And I'm like, why did you do that? So, let's talk about it. His debut album from 1982 is called simply Kenny G. It was a critical success. It eventually would go platinum. This is the album cover that was presented on the CD. And when you look at the album, the real album cover, you'll understand why they changed it. This is the cover of the vinyl album. Uh, and it looks, you know, kind of ridiculous. He looks much younger. The hair was much shorter. But let me tell you, the music is awesome. Uh, mercy, 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 here we are, stop and go. I can't tell you why, which is a marvelous cover of the Eagles song. Uh, the Shuffle, Tell Me, Find a Way, Crystal Mountain, and Come Close. I went back and got this in 1987 after Duo Tones came out in late 86, mid 86. And yeah, that is such a goober. He's such a goober on that picture, without a question. Now you know why they changed it. The second one didn't really need to be changed because it's just a negative picture. But this is the album that first got him attention from pop radio in some ways. This is G-Force from 1983 or 84. And you can see the cover. And here is the cover as seen on the album, uh, the CD version. G-Force is... Fantastic. Hi, How You Doing, which was his first chart single. Do Me Right, Help Yourself to My Love, I Want to Be Yours, Tribeca, Sunset at Noon, I've Been Missing You, and G-Force, the song. Um, what a fantastic album. Of course, these are all on that mid-90s Arista record label. Mid-80s Arista label, excuse me. And he has some able-bodied vocalists working with him on this stuff. But as I said, my introduction to him was with his third album, which he had a single out with uh, R&B singer Kashif called Love on the Rise. that actually charted and uh, on the uh, R&B chart and on the Kirkham Report. This is the album it came from, Kenny G and G-Force, Gravity. He was starting to develop that, that, that uh, signature look and feel at this point. There's the back cover. Now, they didn't change the album covers from this point on. His work with Kashif is fantastic. I'm going to grab my little lamp here so I can read the song titles. Um, we've got yeah, Purple on Gray. Um, no, I'm not going to do it that way. <laughs> this is why I have my Wikipedia page up. Um, the songs on Gravity are Love on the Rise, One Man's Poison, Another Man's Sweetness, Where Do We Take It From Here, One Night Stand, uh, Japan, Sax Attack, Virgin Island, Gravity, and Last Night of the Year. 
I love Warrant Love on the Rise with Kashif. He also has Kashif and Andre Montague on One Man's Poison and Andre on the other two songs, Where Do We Take It From Here and One Night Stand. Marvelous, marvelous album. Marvelous album. And uh, by this point, I already knew that because my first album from Kenny G is the album that everybody's first album was, Duo Tones from 1986. This, of course, has his monster hit Songbird on it. Uh, as well as What Does It Take uh, to Win Your Love? Don't Make Me Wait for Love. Uh, S-A-D-E, I, I don't know if that's pronounced Sade, like the singer. Esther, Slip of the Tongue. Uh, Songbird, Champagne, You Make Me Believe. Uh, Midnight Motion. And um, uh, Three of a Kind. Uh, Champagne is one of my all-time favorite songs by him. I don't think it was released as a single. Uh, and, I mean, this whole album was fantastic, and obviously I went back and got the earlier stuff. Never got tired of listening to him, because I just think he is terrific. He does for the saxophone what Herb Alpert did for the trumpet in the 1960s, with an even more jazz, because Herb Alpert was more mariachi type jazz, more Mexican style jazz. Kenny G is full on smooth jazz and jazz fusion. Particularly the first two albums are more fusion than smooth jazz. And they're just excellent all the way around. Now after Duo Tones uh, comes Silhouette. This is the first one I have only on CD. This also produced a couple of hits in the title track. Uh, plus Trade Winds, I'll Be Alright, Against Doctor's Orders, Pastel, We've Saved the Best for Last with Smokey Robinson, uh, All in One Night, Summer Song, Let Go, and Home. Summer Song was played everywhere that year as it's, it's often heard on sports programming. You hear it all the time. You'd recognize it if you heard it. Um, came out in October of 1988, and he continued to do really well with his sound. The music, when it comes to instrumental, this is, there's a reason I have a show on Mixcloud called Instrumental, because I like all different types of instrumental music. I like Muzak style. My pal Stuffer White does a great series of specials called The Sound of Muzak that um, you can catch on his channel that are true Muzak type things. I also love beautiful music. I love jazz fusion and smooth jazz and some that's actually bordering on regular jazz like Dave Grusin and Don Grusin I love it all and I love the way I feel um, with duo tones and silhouette in particular which were the, the next two albums um, they were on my CD player or my album my turntable constantly Particularly, Songbird, uh, Midnight Motion, and Champagne off of Duo Tones. And Silhouette just got played from cover to cover, just from end, beginning to end, because it was a CD and it was easier to play that way. He is just excellent. Now, the next album was a live album, Kenny G Live. My mother got me for Christmas that year in 1989. Um, really, I don't do live albums. I don't like live albums that much. This one is great because Kenny gets to completely improv on some of these songs with new sounds. My biggest disappointment um, was that he didn't include uh, Champagne in the set that's on the, on the CD. Um, and it was just a great song. It's just a great song and possibly my favorite Kenny G song of all time. Um, but he did include a lot of the stuff from the last couple of albums, and even going back to the second album, G-Force with Tribeca, um, there was some great stuff on that album. And, and he, if you like a, a, a live album that's more laid back, this one is definitely, um, it has the crowd sounds, you can hear the crowd, but it's more laid back, and it's because of who it is. I mean, it's not Frampton Comes Alive, which, in my opinion, is the best live album of all time, but it's, it is a very much fun to listen to. Now, around that time, they did release a, a um, compilation album 
or two with his earlier stuff on it. Those came out in both America and around the world, Australia, England. He was doing well everywhere. But it took almost three years for his next new album to come out. That was Breathless, which came out in uh, November of 1992. It featured uh, Forever in Love, which was a chart hit. It got terrible reviews from the critics. The critics just are not Kenny G fans. And I think that the critics are mystified by those of us who are Kenny G fans. Um, I love the guy. I love his music. I love the writing. I love everything about it. I love his style of playing. He does some terrific stuff with other artists on this album. Major artists in this case. Uh, Pivo Bryson on By the Time This Night Is Over. And uh, Aaron Neville on uh, Even If My Heart Would Break. But even before that, he would, or end after that, he would do other uh, duets with other people on other albums. This album included The Joy of Life, Forever in Love, which was a hit single. In the Rain, Sentimental, By the Time This Night Is Over, Into the Night, Alone, Morning, Even If My Heart Would Break, G-Bop, Sister Rose, a year, a year Ago, Homeland, Natural Ride, which was on the American album, and then two tracks that were not on the U.S. release. There was the international track, The Wedding Song, and the Japan bonus track, Jasmine Flower. Those I do not have because I have the U.S. version. Um, this album was fantastic all the way around. It is just... I don't know why people give him such crap for it. He is an acquired taste, and there's no doubt about that. But I acquired it early on when Songbird was out, and then to go back and find all this excellent music from him. I, I mean, to me, he is one of the pro top instrumental artists of my generation. Uh, there, When I was a little kid, I mean, we're talking under 10, it was not unusual for instrumentals to crack the top 40 all the time. By the time I was a teenager and in my 20s, you got it only rarely would an instrumental really take off. In the 80s, there were only three huge instrumental hits. There was Axel F. by Harold Faltemeyer, which was from Beverly Hills Cop. There was Michael uh, uh, by Jan Hammer's theme from the Michael Mann TV series, Miami Vice and Songbird by Kenny G. Those were the three biggest instrumental songs of the 80s. Completely different. Herb Alpert had a few hits here and there, and um, there were a couple of other ones, but none as big as those three. You rarely found an instrumental artist that was hitting the top 40 on the pop chart or the top 40 on the AC chart with such regularity, and Kenny G was the first artist since Herb Alpert to do that. After Breathless came his first holiday album. Miracles, the holiday album, was released in November of 1994. It hit number one on the Billboard 200. That's the regular album chart. <coughs> as well as the contemporary jazz albums and the R&B hip-hop chart. What? Um, it also was the best-selling holiday album that year in 94 and in 1996. I always find it funny uh, when Kenny G, who is Jewish by faith, goes out and does stuff that is Christian-oriented, because I know they don't believe in it, and yet his, his versions of, um, of Silent Night and Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas and Away in a Manger, Little Drummer Boy, just blow your mind. He also has the Hanukkah song on this album, and he would follow it up with Faith, a, a holiday album, which was more along the lines of his tradition. I don't have that one on CD. I have it on Just Digital. Um, but his work on these songs for somebody who does not believe in the faith, as Christians do, is just amazing. He does a great job with them and completely makes them his own. And it, it's just something special about it. The final Kenny G album I have that was released new, I haven't picked up the rest of them, was The Moment. It came out in 1996. Um, big hit, Havana, was the second hit on the dance chart. Uh, he also hit with the title track, Passages, Havana, uh, Always That Somebody Was You, The Champion's Theme, East Side Jam, Moonlight, Getting It On The Step, Every Time I Close My Eyes with Babyface, uh, Northern Lights, and Innocence. 
another stupendously good album. Uh, Kenny, Babyface, and Walter Afanasieff produced this. It was marvelous. Um, I don't know why I stopped buying his stuff after this. A lot of times in the late 90s, I just didn't have the funds. I was working for a minimum wage job, and I didn't really have the money to get stuff, and I downloaded a lot of it later. Um, and I have downloaded a couple of the other albums. But these are the albums, these seven or eight that I've mentioned, are his core collection, the albums that had all the big hits on it. Now, he did release a greatest hits compilation in the mid, early 2000s, I think, or maybe the late 90s, that truly had everything on it, 97. He, it was actually like the fourth compilation album, but the first official greatest hits album. And it has everything there. Plus, it has stuff that wasn't on an album. Um, he does um, uh, You Send Me with Michael Bolton, Baby G with, uh, I think that's, uh, that's that was never released, The Dying Young Theme, which was not on any of his albums, his duet with Frank Sinatra from Frank Sinatra's duets album. The man was all over the charts and all over background stuff all through the 90s as well. He had a uh, he, he teamed up with Michael Bolton on a couple of songs. You could hear his sax prominently in Love Power by Dionne Warwick and Jeffrey Osborne. Um, he is just everywhere. Anytime you hear a sax in the 90s at least, in late 80s, early 90s, you would know chances are good that it was one of two people on pop stuff either Kenny G or David Sanborn. Um, they played on everything and they loved doing it. And you can tell the music is just phenomenally good. Now, he has gone on to have so many more uh, albums over the years that I do not have. Um, among those, uh, Paradise from 2002, Classics in the Key of G, which is a covers album, from 1999, he did a duets album, a romantic melodies album. He's done some Brazilian and uh, Italian style music. Um, he was with Arista most of those years. He didn't switch labels until 2006, I think they said, was when he started recording for Concord. Um, all of his stuff is awesome. If you haven't... I think the big thing is with him is that so many people don't really get to know his music because it's just so easy to say, oh, Kenny G, what fluff. Even he has called his music fluff. Even he has said he didn't necessarily think it was all that great to be a musician because of all the rehearsal they had to do. That comes from a quote from the movie. <coughs> but I can tell you he's brought me hours of happiness and enjoyable listening pleasure. When I used to work third shift, when I lived in Ohio, I had uh, Silhouette uh, with me all the time, and I would play it as I was working. I worked at a convenience store, third shift, and I would play that album almost every night. I loved it that much. There were regular selections at that time, Kenny G's um, Sil Silhouettes, is that the name of the album? And... Katie Lang's Ingenue, John Bon Jovi's uh, Young Guns 2 soundtrack, um, two or three other ones I played all the time. Ricky Martin's second album, Mi Amaras. Kenny G was right there with everybody. I don't know if he's my favorite instrumental artist of all time because I like so many. I am a huge Herb Alpert fan. I talked about him on Influencers already. Um, I'm going to talk about Yanni, a little bit later this season, and I will be talking about John Tesh next season. I love both of their stuff. If it's keyboards, if it's saxophone, and if it's guitar, Joe Satriani, another one of my favorites coming up this season, um, those are the three instruments I gravitate to when it comes to pop and rock music. Um, Kenny G's sax. I love, I love David Sanborn, who we just lost recently. Um, too, but he played the alto sax. Kenny plays the soprano sax usually. And, I mean, I grew up around Boots Randolph. My mom was a huge fan of Boots Randolph. So I love his stuff too. If it's a sax, if it's 
a guitar, rock guitar in particular, although I love acoustic too. And, oh yeah, Craig Chiqueso, I've talked about him too. And piano and keyboards. Those are the instruments I gravitate to. And Kenny G is excellent at what he does. You can poo-poo him. You can make fun of him. He even made fun of himself in, in um, Being Kenny G, the, the movie, or Listening to Kenny G, I think it is, um, which I haven't seen. I admit, I as much as I love Penny's work as a filmmaker, and I've loved Nuts, which is just a great film, and I love Hail Satan, which was also a great film, um, I haven't been able to bring myself to watch it yet. I have same reason I haven't been able to bring myself to watching the Herb Alpert or the Lucas Cram ones either. One of these days I will, and I will review them when I do. But um, there's just something special about Kenny G's music. And I think people find it so easy to poo-poo him because they haven't really listened to him. I challenge you. Listen to Duo Tones. Listen to Silhouette. Listen to Breathless. That's the one I had uh, with me at, 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 on my job. Um, put them on. Just let them wash over you. They are intensely interesting. They are relaxing. They will make your cares flow away. He is an artist that deserves to be respected more than he is among listeners and critics. Shame on you, critics. He is just that good. And it's why I enjoy him so much. So, just because he's easy to rag on doesn't mean you should be. Listen to him and see what you think. Because you might just actually like it. Thank you for coming by and watching Influencers this week. I know probably people were turning out because of who it is, but you know something? That's okay. I, I mean, I don't like it, but I love Kenny G and I'm not afraid to say it and I hope everybody will give him a chance just like you've given me a chance right here on this show and all my stuff all the time. If you've already subscribed to my channel, thank you. If you haven't, please do. Don't forget to share out what we've got uh, on uh, TKR Video Central, all kinds of different shows. And please leave a comment. I don't know how I'm doing if you don't leave me a comment. Comments are what the life and breath of a site like mine. So please drop me a line. Um, if you'd love to support us, we've got some great swag, like this shirt and several others, up on the, um, let me do that again because I couldn't see, up on my uh, uh, swag shop, which there's a link in the show notes. And if you could see fit to be our Patreon, we definitely uh, appreciate it. It's two ninety nine a month. Helps us pay our bills a little bit, maybe make some uh, a little extra so we can buy some more music. And uh, that would be very cool. You can do that at patreon.com uh, backslash TKR Video Central. And there's a link to that in the show notes as well. More of my crazy influencers are coming up in the next few weeks. Some of which you might be surprised by. Some of which you may have never heard of. And others I think you'll agree with me on. All as part of this season of Influencers. Until next time, I'm T.C. Kirkham, TKR Video Central, and the Kirkham Report for Influencers. I will see you on the interwebs everywhere, every day. I hope you enjoy what you get. Ciao, baby.